there we go. So this is the view from my work. Um, uh, beautiful view across the river to see the Houses of Parliament. Um, and yes, thank you so much for inviting me to be here because it's such a pleasure um, to be here. Um, I have one disclosure. Um, there is my Twitter handle. So again, I'm a not brilliant tweeter, but I do enjoy a bit of Twitter. So um, I learn a lot from Twitter. Actually, it, it's probably what keeps me up to date better than anything else. So understanding intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, um, I mean, first off, we need to say that a lot of us still call it obstetric cholestasis, which is um, a, an old fashioned name. It's not the uh, medically correct name, but it's um, what's familiar to many, many people. Um, and you'll know that the old Royal College guidance used to be called obstetric cholestasis, but now it's intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. So I think gradually it will move over. Um, so here's a picture um, of the impact of ICP on skin. It's the most common liver specific pregnancy um, condition, um, typically presenting in the third trimester, but we know that women have presented from as early as even six weeks. Um, and the main clinical feature is itching, as Ali said and described so beautifully. Um, the itching can be very mild, it can be very severe. And um, although we know it is itching, um, uh, in the absence of a rash, actually you do often see very excoriated rashes and you can see the results of itching both in the line marks and also in some of the skin changes. So the presence of um, some sort of rash often secondary to itching can be just ICP, well just ICP, can be as a result of ICP and not a second condition. We also know it as um, being associated with abnormal liver enzymes and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And it's really defined by um, raised serum bile acids. So I'm going to talk about bile acids because if I'm honest with you, when I started research, I don't think I really knew the difference between bilirubin and bile acids. And a lot of people don't know the difference. And um, bile acids are um, produced in the liver. They go into the gallbladder and they're excreted within the bile. They're not just bile, there's also some fats as well. Um, and they work like a detergent to help your fat be dissolved when you eat. Um, and that was really my only understanding, but actually bile acids are hormones. They are molecules that do an awful lot. Now, it doesn't matter what all this stuff shows, but what it shows is that they have huge impacts on many, many tissues in the body. So if you have abnormalities in your bile acid, it's going to affect lots of your metabolism and lots of how you are. And that's why they're important. Now, even more science, and this is very simple, I promise, um, for this time in the evening, Bile acids are produced from cholesterol. So there's a picture of cholesterol you can see, it's very similar. Most of them are produced in the liver and they form primary bile acids called cholic acid or chelinodeoxycholic acid. So you may see some bile acid measurements are broken down into different types and that's telling you just what different types there are. Um, then these go out in the bile, as I said, they get squirted into the gut when we eat. And then in the gut, the bacteria there can convert them to be a different type of bile acid, a secondary bile acid. And I've put some of the names down there. Um, now, um, lithocholic acid, deoxycholic acid, um, those are bad ones, we don't like those, but you'll see at the bottom, ursodeoxycholic acid is produced in very, very, very small amounts naturally in humans. It comes from bears, which is where ursa comes from, it's the Latin for bear, but it is a bile acid. So when you see people's bile acids, including urso, it is a bile acid. And when patients take um, urso and you measure bile acid, you will be measuring their urso, but it changes the type of bile acids that are there from unhealthy ones to healthy ones. And typically it makes up about 60% of the bile acids um, that you're measuring when you get a total bile acid result. So that can be something that can be now, this looks scary again, don't worry. Um, what happens in the gut to these bile acids? So the little green multi-shaped things are your bile acids. The vast majority of them get absorbed across the intestinal wall um, through something called intestinal bile acid transporter or IBA. Um, But some of them can get passively absorbed down in the colon. And that, that means that then they get sent back up to the liver and you have this continuous circulation from your gut to your liver, to your gut to your liver of your bile acids. Very few bile acids are lost. The majority that are lost are um, in the feces, a few are lost in the urine. So what happens in um, pregnancy? Well, um, fetuses produce bile acids and normally they have a lower concentration than the mother so that bile acids can cross the placenta and go to the mother and be excreted that way. But in cholestasis, the mother has these high bile acids and so the bile acids pass in reverse across to the baby so the baby can develop high, much higher bile acid concentrations. 
What are the consequences? Well, you've heard already about the itching, the pruritus. Women are also more likely to develop gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and liver dysfunction. So um, the most, but not all women by a long way, will have abnormal liver enzymes. About 10% will develop jaundice, so they get the yellowing of the eyes, dark urine. Um, and uh, sometimes you can also get something called steatorrhea, which is where you get a very fatty stool because you're not breaking down your fats. And that can impact the um, absorption of your fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin K, which is important in blood clotting. How about the baby? Um, it, well, there's lots of studies have suggested it's associated with hypoxia, so low oxygen in the baby. The baby's more likely to pass meconium. It can be associated with preterm birth and it can be associated with stillbirth. And I think um, particularly this week, that's a really important place to start. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that because obviously it's the most um, severe impact of cholestasis. So what's the risk of stillbirth in ICP? Now, I went online and it took me approximately one minute to find this article, which I think is absolutely petrifying. If you are diagnosed with ICP and you go on Google, you find something saying my wife couldn't sleep. That's quite appealing to look at. And you read something that says without active management, the risk of stillbirth is as high as 15 percent. And I think that's horrifying. It's not true. It's based on studies um, from the 1970s on very small numbers of women um, and women who had um, severe, severe disease with jaundice. But it's scary. And I think this picture is a wonderful depiction, particularly in World Mental Health Week, of the real impact of cholestasis. Um, it can be hugely distressing um, to patients. I saw somebody today who um, the, the fear of cholestasis is just debilitating. So as well as not sleeping, itching, and all of those consequences on your mental health, it can have a real impact just from the anxiety of what might happen. So what did we do to really answer this? Well, we did a big study where we looked at all of the research that had been done by everybody across the world to try to work out what the stillbirth rate was. And we've got all of the individual patient details sent from all of these centers across the world. Um, and we looked at um, about 5,000 patients and we use that to be able to predict when stillbirth happened. So we looked at what their maximum bile acid concentration was. And this graph on the left, um, the blue lines show how many people had the maximum bile acid in that um, level. So on the left, you can see 0 to 19 and 20 to 39. Most patients will have bile acids um, in that region, about 60%, and they will never go above that. Towards the other side, about 10% will end up with bile acids at some point in the pregnancy over 100. And what's important for these patients is the, the red bars, which is the risk of stillbirth massively increases. So you can see the risk of stillbirth if your bile acids are always below 100 is up to 0.28%, um, which is um, when we looked at all of the individual countries and compared it with the national stillbirth rates, it's no different. But when you look at women whose bile acids are over 100, they have a 3.5% risk, so a 10 times risk of stillbirth for those pregnancies. And those are the women that we have to um, think about a little bit more about how we can safely keep those pregnancies safely going and when to deliver. Now, what's also important in this study is that we looked at peak liver enzymes, so the ALT, AST, and bilirubin, and none of those concentrations are associated with stillbirth. So they show you how the liver's functioning, but they don't tell you what the risk of the baby is. And that's quite reassuring when someone's got awful liver enzymes, but their bile acid's low, that you say, yes, we need to look after your liver, but actually um, your baby is not impacted by the liver enzymes. But it's a little bit more about your at a risk of stillbirth. When is this risk likely to happen? And this is what we showed um, when we looked a little bit more. So this is the risk of stillbirth for every week that the baby is still alive. And the red line is for babies from mums who have bile acids over 100 at any point in the pregnancy. The purple is with moderate disease, which is 40 to 100. And the green is below that. And what you can see here is there's a really marked increase um, at usually about 35 weeks. Um, and that's what goes behind some of our recommendations about um, optimal time of delivery. Now, stillbirth, um, the national rate um, has gone up, unfortunately, at about 0.4% in the UK. Here it is. And you can see that even earlier in the pregnancy, the risk of stillbirth is higher for these patients. But obviously, prematurity at that stage has more impact. Before 35 weeks, you do see this slightly higher rate, but after 35 weeks, um, if a woman is still pregnant with bile acids over 100, the risk is um, above 1.5%. And if the pregnancy goes on, um, you can see it even goes above 4% later in the pregnancy. 
So that's why for those patients, I recommend that we um, discuss uh, delivery birth, um, usually around 35 weeks. In terms of um, other things, I just want to point out this little um, box on the right, which is women who have bile acids between, 30, uh, between 40 and 100 do seem to have a slight increased risk of stillbirth in the last week. So for those women, I tend to offer delivery from 38 weeks, but the women with bile acids below 40 have no increased risk um, of stillbirth for as long as we um, were able to get enough data for. So here are my clinical pearls, and I've got a few slides of these, things to take away. Peak bile acids more than 100, have a tenfold increased risk of stillbirth. This risk increases markedly from 35 weeks, and 90% of patients have bile acids below this level. The liver function tests are not associated with stillbirth. Now I'm gonna speed up a little bit more now because it's slightly less um, critical, but I think if you can remember anything, that will help you reassure and appropriately identify women at risk. Why did babies die? Well, we think it's probably because of an arrhythmia. This is a cell-based thing where you um, put bile acids on the cell model of a fetal heart. And you can see if you add bile acids to it, the normal rhythmic contraction changes and they get this um, re-entry arrhythmia, which mimics what we think might happen for the babies. And when we looked at fetal ECG, so not fetal heart rate, but an ECG, we could see that in mums where um, they had uh, polystatic pregnancy, not taking their hydroxychloric acid, there were signs of fetal heart um, uh, strain and alterations in the fetal ECG that could put the baby at risk of fetal arrhythmia. Um, other things, the UCOS study is the UK Obstetric Surveillance System. It's a national study that I'm sure many of you have heard of and recruit patients to report on. Um, and when we looked at severe cholestasis, we, it's, now we define it as moderate, seven of the 10 women who had a stillbirth had another condition. So this is going to lead to my next clinical pearls. Um, stillbirth happens not in a baby that isn't growing well. It happens in a normally grown baby. Um, so we can't do ultrasound to predict stillbirth. That's going to tell us if the placenta is not working, if there's um, fetal growth restriction, but not arrhythmia-based and um, stillbirth. We can't detect that from a CTG because that's going to tell us a fetal heart rate and not more subtle um, aspects unless it's in the acute arrhythmia itself. We're not going to know which babies are at risk of that. And then the other thing to say is if somebody's got two things going on, so if they've got diabetes and cholestasis, those babies may be at higher risk. They may be almost like a multiple hit. Um, so those um, women are ones that I worry about a little bit more as well. Now, preterm birth is also increased in cholestasis. And this is a more complicated picture, but essentially the same. The more severe your bile acids are, the more likely you are to have a preterm birth. The purple bars are iatrogenic, so clinician indicated. So it's an elective cesarean section or an induction of labor. And what's really marked is how high the rates of that have been despite the fact that I've told you those babies are not at increased risk of stillbirth. So I think there is a real window to improve care for patients just by stopping inducing their labours because they have cholestasis, letting them have a term birth of a healthy baby that's less likely to need um, admission to the intensive care unit, um, just like I explained earlier. Can we do anything? Well, urso deoxycholic acid, UDCA, urso, whichever shortened version we want to call it, and I flip between them, does seem to improve um, preterm birth rates. So here are two um, results. And what you can see is the blue line on the right is for patients who have bile acids over 40. If they were given um, placebo, so no um, uh, active treatment, the rate of still uh, preterm birth was higher, markedly about double than if they um, were given urso deoxycholic acid. So for women with bile acids over 40, there is a reduction in preterm birth, spontaneous preterm birth, um, if we give birth so. Um, is it a benefit for any other outcomes? Well, yes. A composite outcome, which was stillbirth plus preterm birth, was reduced with urso. And also there's reduced meconium staining. So urso is for benefit. Now I'm going to address the elephant in the room, which is the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists' I, um, new green top guidelines, written by three of my friends. So I don't want to criticize them at all, but what that says is um, that we need to advise women there are no treatments that um, can improve pregnancy outcomes and we shouldn't routinely offer ERSO. 
That's based on two studies. One is the PITCHES um, randomized control trial, which was 2019, which is the biggest study of ERSO. And those data were part of the data for the previous study. Um, and it's also based on the Cochrane study, where they used that and a few other studies um, to suggest that there was no benefit. But that was 2020. And what I have to say is, this study where we brought everything together was in 2021. So it is an update. So um, yes, the Royal College Green Top Guidelines says don't give ERSO. I personally disagree. And I think we have clear evidence that tells us that um, for women with prion acids over 40 and before 37 weeks, there is a benefit to reduce the risk of spontaneous preterm. So there are my clinical pearls for this. Um, preterm birth is markedly increased. Um, we can reduce the amount um, for many, many patients with ICP who don't have severe disease. And we can give ERSO to women with bile acids over 40 to reduce preterm birth. When should we diagnose ICP? Well, um, bile acids go up after you eat. So this is a study where we gave lots of people a standardized diet and measured their bile acid concentrations. Um, and you can see here in blue that women with um, moderate disease they started off with their bile acids when they were fasting quite low, and even some of those, three of those went over 100. So if we look at women's bile acid concentrations when they're fasting, we're going to miss which women have severe disease, and we would recommend early delivery. But then you have to look at the bottom. The red and white ones are patients who have mild disease or uncomplicated pregnancies, and there's a huge overlap. So if we do use these fasting levels, we're probably going to diagnose women without cholestasis with having cholestasis. And for that reason, we looked at all patients without cholestasis and what's the normal range. And in pregnancy, bile acids increase. In the third trimester, two different studies have demonstrated that we need to increase our rate, our, our um, diagnostic threshold, because if we're using non-fasting levels, it should probably be around 19, which is what the Royal College suggests, and I agree with. And so they've come up with this definition that you can have itching and you can have severe itching, and that does not change. Um, uh, your itching dependent upon your disease severity based on bile acids. Gestational pruritus is women who are itching in pregnancy, but bile acids are below 19. And then we can grade um, cholestasis accordingly. So those are my clinical pearls. Bile acids rise after food. If we want to know how severe it is, look after food, but use a higher reference range. Um, then coming on to the, the itch, and we are coming towards the end, uh, but the itch has a huge detrimental impact on the quality of life. The majority of patients have what we would class as severe itching, um, and this can have huge impacts on people's quality of life, their feelings of hopelessness, anxiety, and it can really impact how patients can live. So understanding that is so important. Does ERSO help? Well, ERSO has a very mild benefit overall when we look at all pregnant women. This is the Cochrane Review and it showed a reduction of about seven points on a hundred point scale. And in reality, I think some patients benefit, some patients don't. When we looked in a bit more detail, you can see the red are the patients with ERSO and on the right are more severe. So either those with fewer itchier at the start all those with moderate or severe disease are more likely to have a benefit than those with milder disease, either with it, uh, lower itch or with um, lower bile acids. But we need more treatment because it's not enough. So there are, there are two clinical trials that I'm thrilled are recruiting because in obstetrics, we do not have many clinical trials. And we've got two. One is um, run out of Australia by Bill Haig, and we'll be recruiting a number of UK centres imminently for terrific comparing ERSO with rifampicin. The other is um, uh, uh, funded by a pharmaceutical company, which is even rarer in obstetrics to have a um, pharma putting money in. And I'm so grateful that they are interested, despite how challenging clinical trials are. And that's the Ohana study, which is looking at the IBAP, that um, bile acid uptake transport of blocking that. So using a medicine that stays in the gut, it isn't absorbed, it can't go into the mother's blood, so it won't cross the placenta, but it's going to block your bile acids being absorbed. So that is also recruiting in the UK, America, and New Zealand at the moment. So here's my final slide, and there are so many more questions that I haven't been able to cover, and I'm very happy to answer any of them now. Um, because there are so many questions, again, I'm coming back to ICP support because I don't have time to answer all of them, but the answers generally are on, on their website, which has a lot of resources. And it's lovely to hear the stories from patients um, who have been able to use the charity and their resources that have given them fantastic pregnancy outcomes that will write for them. Uh, I work with 400,000 people. They don't fit on my slide anymore. But just to show you how collaborative our research is, this is worldwide research. Um, and it's a 
privilege and a pleasure to be able to apply it and to help patients. Thank you.